the muzzleloaders.com podcast, your source for all things muzzleloading. How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Muzzleloaders podcast, the show where we talk about anything and everything black powder. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about whitetail hunting, and we are joined by a special guest, Tony Smotherman from BPI. Uh, how the heck are you doing today, Tony? Brother, any better? I couldn't stand it. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing wonderful. Uh, really excited to talk about some whitetail hunting today because, uh, as many of you on the podcast know, I have one of my first whitetail hunt coming up here in a couple of weeks, and I selfishly invited Tony onto the podcast so that I could steal some of his knowledge for myself, and hopefully you guys can benefit from it too. So, <laughs> but I'm not uh, sure how much there is to steal, but I'll do my best to help out any way I can. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I'm sure. I'm sure that you know more than I do. So. Um, well, but the first thing I kind of want to talk about is a little bit about you, Tony, your background. Uh, what do you do with BPI, all that kind of stuff? You bet, man. Well, number one, it's a pleasure to be here on the Muzzler Podcast. Uh, just the name in itself is near and dear to my heart. Um, and with that said, I've been working uh, in the hunting industry uh, since I was about 19 years old. Uh, and you can tell if you can see my face here, this gray <laughs> here at the bottom is not 19 years old. Um, there's, there's a lot of age and wisdom here, uh, behind this old gray beard that's starting to come on. Um, I started 19, uh, as an outdoor writer, uh, for the sheer fact that I really wanted to be in the hunting industry, not, um, I guess not to be a, a celebrity style individual that some people think about when they want to get in, get in the hunting industry. Uh, I got into it, uh, for the sheer fact of, I truly believe that the outdoors is kind of what saved me from going down. Well, from going down a bad path, mm. um, I was I was introduced um, not at a real early age to big game hunting, but I was introduced to the outdoors at a very young age. Uh, my dad was a big, um, well, here in the South, it's pretty big uh, and has been for, for decades, generations, uh, is coon hunting. And mm. my dad was a big coon hunter, and I started coon hunting uh, at the age of four. And, and that was uh, for the sheer fact that we utilized coon pelts or raccoon pelts if you will depending on where yeah. you're from uh <laughs> we utilize those pelts to, to basically uh subsidize our income mm. uh when i was a young man a, a a really good coon pelt would bring 25 bucks um time you stack a, a freezer full of them over a period of a hunting season it ends up to be pretty large dollars yeah um but i, I did that up until i was i don't know mid-teens and uh of course no matter if you're a guy or girl or or whatever the case may be. When you become a teenager, uh, things start changing. Your body and your vision starts changing um, of things you want to do. Not so much that you lose 20-20 vision, but, mm -hmm. well, well, maybe you do. You don't. Just, you just don't see things clearly as, as uh, some people think you should at that age. And I lost um, my 20-20 vision in high school, so. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I understand. Uh, I am losing it now, but it's not in high school. Um, I, I, just, I just got a little sideways, you know. I maybe got around the wrong crowd, which I know there's – that happens. Mm -hmm. Um, and fortunate for me, uh, I, I'm was in a, uh, class we have here in, uh, or in my school here and pretty popular across the country is called FFA, uh, mm -hmm. which is future farmers of America and pretty much where all the country boys hanged out at or hung out at, if you will. Um, and, and this guy that I had run into there was a big bow hunter and he introduced me to bow hunting, which kind of goes against what I really love to do today. And that's obviously hunting with a muzzleloader. Mm -hmm. uh, but he introduced me to hunting uh, whitetail with a bow and arrow. And then from that point on, uh, I went away from the party and teenage lifestyle that I was living uh, to where my full focus and dedication uh, was to getting bed or getting in bed early on Friday and Saturday night uh, and not out doing things I shouldn't do. Uh, that way that I could focus on, uh, whitetail hunting and and I realized when I was around 18 19 20 years old that, that actually hunting the outdoors is what pulled me out of that bad lifestyle and probably got me out of a whole lot of trouble uh, so I become an outdoor rider um, and that that terminology is very loose when I say an outdoor rider because I kind of had a hard time spelling my own name because <laughs> in high school English was not my first class of choice yeah um and, and I'm sure that a lot of people have crossed that path. But at the, the end of the day, um, really, if you set your mind to do something, no matter what that is, whether it's be a doctor, a lawyer, a brain surgeon, a fireman, or an outdoor writer, you can, in fact, do so if you want to do it bad enough. Mm -hmm. 
for sure. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've been working at this company since I was 16 and, you know, I started out sweeping floors and, uh, you know, just doing the intern work, if you will. I was supposed to be here for two weeks and, uh, I ended up getting, I'm still here. It's like six years later. So (laughs) it's like, you know, you put in today. Exactly. If you put in the work, you can, you can make anything happen. That's what's so great about, uh, about where we live. So. I guarantee you. And that's, that was my whole mindset of as English was not my class of choice. I had a, obviously you can tell from my, from my slang or my, the way I speak, (laughs) I'm from the South. So uh, English sometimes not my first language. It seems to be. Yeah. Um, But I knew that I needed to do something uh, to tell the world how cool the outdoors was. Mm -hmm. And at that time there was nothing like what we're doing here today. Technology was not, involved we didn't have cell phones it's basically many computers we did not have zoom meetings we did not have the cameras that you're looking at there on your desk Mm -hmm. Uh, it was all handwritten stuff so when i would write articles um it would be uh on i'd I'd actually handwrite them then i I hired somebody to type those letters articles out for me Mm. and then i would send them to local publications across my state and then of course that that progress expanded past just writing for local publications but the whole goal was is to show and tell everybody what a cool place the outdoors is. And if it could save me from being in a bad spot, it could save a lot of other people. Um, and that eventually turned into uh, a full-time job in the hunting industry. And I've been involved now since I was 19 and, and I am 47 today um, and work for a wonderful company, CBA. And, and basically all that started uh, was because I started hosting outdoor TV shows and mm-hmm. was I worked for another gun or another muzzleloader manufacturer. I worked for night rifles back in the day Mm. um, from 19. Oh man, this is going to plague me here from (laughs) 1994 up to about 2009. I worked directly uh, with Tony Knight, the gentleman Mm. who uh, obviously behind the modern day inline craze that we know now and and the original man behind night rifles that started in Kirksville, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Um, was Tony so I was fortunate Knight, to work with him for quite a long time. So when did Tony Knight, um, I believe he's, he sold Knight, correct, and and stepped away? That That is correct. Yes, sir. Yep, and, yep. He, um, and I don't I don't know that exact year to tell you what year he sold the company to a, a – uh, yeah, he sold the company to another company called Pradco. Mm. Uh, and Pradco's a really big name in the hunting industry. owns lots of companies. Uh, and he sold out to them. And, and I worked uh, through that transition with Pradco for quite a long time. And, um, uh, that basically set my movement forward in the hunting industry because I, mm. uh, during that tenure with those guys, I wrote all the safety instructional DVDs that went out with every muzzle loader. Uh, I hosted, um, after a period of time of writing the DVDs, I actually hosted the, D- the DVDs for, I don't know, the last six or seven years that they produced those and mm. those guns or those DVDs went out with every gun that people bought. And basically it was, Congratulations on the purchase of your new night rifle. Today, I will teach you how to learn and maintain your new muzzle loader. Um, so, I said that about fifty thousand times over, I think. Um, but uh, that basically started snowballing in from being or having a dream of being an outdoor writer uh, to pushing that through to writing for multiple publications across the country, mm-hmm. uh, which got me into working for night rifles which then led into owning my own outdoor publication. I owned my home state of Tennessee magazine called Tennessee Outdoor News. I owned and published it for 10 years uh, and then hosted several outdoor TV shows. Uh, Number one was Night Rifles, Born to Hunt TV. Mm -hmm. Then it went to Summit's High Places, Moultrie's The Hit List, and then the last show that I hosted was my own show, uh, affectionately called Traveling Hunter. Hey, there uh, you go. And we here today. Yeah. <laughs> and so are, are you still on TV shows? Because I know a lot of your job at BPI is you are working with a lot of people on TV shows. Do you still appear in those? So so when I started uh, at the position that I am now here at BPI, which is head of influencer relations, um, and that's a pretty fancy title. I like to dumb it down, call it a redneck politician. Um, <laughs> but, but my job, uh, it's, it, under this umbrella here that I am now is I handle everything and every person that I basically used to be with the exception of guys like you right now, uh, a podcaster. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I work with all aspects of media for our brand, which I've kind of covered them in my career in the industry, uh, outdoor writers, 
um, uh, television show hosts, uh, national pro staffers, magazine owners, editors, publishers, uh, and now obviously YouTube and podcasters as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like a really fun job. That's one of my favorite parts about the job that I get to do now at muzzleloaders is just the relationships. You know, you get to talk to people like yourself that are really passionate about the outdoors and passionate about muzzleloading and just kind of share in that experience with them. You betcha. You know, it is, it, uh, I have had a, an amazing blessing, uh, in my time in the hunting industry to do, uh, the things that I have done. Um, but my most important memories out of all the stuff that I've done is the people that I met along the way, mm -hmm. whether it's, um, uh, a kind of a hermit guy that I met on Prince William sound, uh, in, um, just outside of Homer, Alaska, mm -hmm. or uh, a dog sled guy in Newfoundland, um, uh, those memories last a lifetime because those individuals were so unique uh, yeah. and they were such a big impression on me um, that my fondest memories is not the critter or the bear that I shot in Newfoundland or the bear that I shot in Alaska. It was the folks that I got to spend time with For sure. on those trips. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um and kind of along those lines, uh, you said that you used to archery hunt and you kind of switched over to muzzleloader at some point in time. That's like your really your passion now. Uh, was there an individual that kind of pointed you down those roads or? So, so it was out of sheer necessity. Uh, hmm. I, I do love to still archer hunt today. Uh, I've probably been six or eight times here in the last couple of weeks. Um, I got a vault full of bows here behind me right now. Um, but what basically transferred me into my passion for mostly hunting whitetail at the time uh, with a muzzleloader was for the sheer fact of I needed content to write articles when I was 19, 20, 21, 22 years old. Mm. Uh, and most of the articles that I personally read uh, to become a better whitetail hunter at that time were whitetail hunting publications. And then typically the articles that I would read were not articles about how to shoot a spike buck. Mm -hmm. They were articles how to shoot a big deer. So I thought, well, coming from me as a reader, if I'm going to be the writer, I need to write about big deer. Yeah. And coming from the South, we've never been known as a big, let me take that back, volumetric, we've always been known as a lot of deer. But mm -hmm. we've never really been known as big whitetail. Uh, and typically, the further away you you get away from the equator, the bigger the bodies of the animals are, the different genetic species change, their bodies get bigger, their antlers get bigger. So the further north you get, the bigger animals. So I, fear, I realized, and I'm not a real smart guy, but I realized if I want to shoot a big deer, I had to be where they live. I had to hunt them where they lived at. Mm -hmm. And that was not in my backyard in the state of Tennessee. So I had to go to where they lived, which typically at that time, the most of the stuff I read about really big giant whitetail was out of the Midwest. And that's Ohio, um, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, even over in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Really big whitetail were being produced, but there was one really huge limitation. Number one, I had to have critters on the ground to get trophy photos to write the article about. And I grew up here shooting a centerfire rifle, mm -hmm. um, a 30 out 6 or 270 is kind of what I started out with when I got into hunting with centerfire stuff here. But in the Midwest, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. shotgun or muscle or only. And again, at the time, uh, early, 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 early nineties, um, there was only two really great companies out there at the time in the muzzle loading industry, um, that I followed, uh, CBA has been around for quite a long time, but the one that I was familiar with, uh, was, uh, white and night. Yeah. Uh, so I ended up, um, after seeing what Roger Ragland does, uh, or did with a white muzzle loader at the time, which I did enough, he almost influenced me to buy a white muzzle loader. Um, and now he's a good friend of mine, which mm -hmm. is such a crazy turn of events. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I end up, uh, pursuing my passion by quitting the job I had at, at 20 years old. I worked at Nissan motor manufacturing facility. I quit my job when I left. I had one week's vacation saved up and they in turn paid me for that week's vacation, which was $525. Here's how things, uh, morph. Uh, and you look back now and it's crystal clear at the time. You didn't realize why things happened, mm -hmm. but I had $525 uh, vacation voucher. Basically they wrote me a check for when I left that job to pursue the outdoor industry full time. 
and the only gun I could afford was a night rifle. Hmm. The white was too expensive. I could not afford it. Interesting. So I bought a night just what I could afford. There were some locally here, some dealers here in my area uh, in Middle Tennessee had some. So I bought one of those and then went basically uh, on six months hunting tours across the Midwest every year for years on end. And that's what drove me to have a passion for muzzleloaders for the sheer fact that I had to have one to write articles. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. And I know, I know it's interesting you say that uh, the populations are really dense down south. And as I was looking into it and as I've had conversations with other people that we've had on the podcast, the population of deer down south is almost unfathomable to me. Like I was looking, Mississippi has almost 40 deer per square mile, which is insane. And yeah, even man. Tennessee has 20 and, you know, and I was like, okay, well, that's fine. It must be the winters. Like, cause Oregon has five deer per square mile. Like it must be the winters, you know, like the winters are much better down there, but then even States like Wisconsin and Michigan, like they're around 30 deer per square mile. So what do you think it is about these States in the Midwest uh, and down South that produce such high deer populations? You know, and I, so I have a couple of theories. Uh, when I owned Tennessee Outdoor News back in the day, uh, one of my diligent studies was to understand how states around Tennessee would produce bigger whitetail. Say case for uh, case for instance here, Kentucky uh, is has been for years like the number three, four Boone and Crockett producing state in the country. Mm-hmm. It touches Tennessee, and there's no giant wall between the two. So why is Kentucky so much better at producing big deer than Tennessee is? So for a long time, I studied different genetic species. And I do believe, uh, best of my memory, it's been a while since I've checked, but there's like 28 different subspecies of white-tailed deer in North America. Um, all of them, obviously, different genetic structures, growth habits. Uh, mm-hmm. It's totally different. Um, but way back in the 50s and 60s, there were no deer here in our country. Uh, I the guys who taught me how to hunt whitetail here in my local community uh, told me stories many times when I was in my 20s about the first time they ever saw a deer. Even further back, the first time they ever saw their first deer track hmm. here in Tennessee. Um, but the uh, it, it, per studying uh, and, and understanding uh, some history here, um, number one, our habitat is amazing. Our habitat is very thick and dense in most areas. Um, you guys' uh, terrain, I would would gather, is pretty open, mm-hmm. uh, making them very visible. Here, that if you say Tennessee has 20 deer per square mile, um, you won't see that those 20 deer in that square mile because mm-hmm. the, t- the the timber is so dense and uh, the cover is so thick. Uh, but back in the 50s and 60s, what I was getting at is is like the South would go to Michigan, Minnesota, some of the really big deer producing states, uh, and would trade, if you will. They, they would embargo whitetail from up north and bring them down here, uh, which those deer up there are very hardy, very tough, because that Mm -hmm. deals with some very nasty cold winters, which we don't hear. So it's like, it's like, uh, say for instance, a guy coming from Wisconsin and he moves down to Florida. If he can deal with humidity, He's going to love it there because he don't have, you know, uh, <laughs> seven or eight months of winter time. Yeah. So when they moved those deer here from the northern states, they just seemed to thrive. And then the habitat just made it very conducive uh, to grow thick, dense populations here. So you say that, you know, that you move down south, there's a lot more of the population, but you might not necessarily see them because it is so densely forested. And uh, that honestly makes a lot of sense because in my area, we live like a little pocket of trees here, but for the majority of Eastern Oregon down to Southern Oregon, it's a lot of sagebrush, pretty open. But when you get into Western Oregon, there is a lot of just dense, it's like a rainforest. It's a jungle, you know, literally. And that's where a lot of the deer are. That's where a lot of the blacktail population is. And a lot of the density is just in that little strip. Uh, and so that makes a lot of sense. So I guess if, if you're hunting in those areas where it is really dense and things like that, how are you going to strategize um, how are you going to find those deer in that area? You know, it's, it's a solid question. And, and growing up uh, with, a, well, I say with a dad, but also w- with a family to even be broader than that, that did not deer hunt. Mm-hmm. Pretty much everything that I did was basically by reading publications, uh, reading magazines, North American Whitetail, Buckmasters, deer and deer hunting, mm-hmm. uh, publications like this, where I 
taught myself how to deer hunt with the exception of a help of a couple of buddies here or there. Um, but I always uh, had a very difficult time because when you, when I was reading these publications, they were talking about several key features uh, that we would see in timber. Uh, and that's where you would narrow the whitetail um, traffic down, if you will. And, and the, some of the terminology was pinch point, bottlenecks, draws, funnels. Uh, so every time I'd go to the timber, I would have those terminologies in the back of my mind. And I'd go to my family farm that, that I still own today and still hunt whitetail on today. But I'd go there looking for these pinch points, funnels, and draws. And again, our timber is thick, mm-hmm. dense and big and i never could find these key areas that they talked about so it was basically uh flying by the seat of my pants for a long time until i made that first journey to the midwest Mm -hmm. i went to illinois i went to the southern portion of illinois there become big pockets of timber and farmland and and mixtures amongst each other Mm -hmm. and within two or three days of being in the land of lincoln i understood what a pinch point a bottleneck and a funnel and a draw and all those things yeah. were uh, basically places that narrowed a whitetail's traffic down to where you could pinpoint where they're coming through. Um, so the southern portion of the country, or we'll, we'll even go the southeast portion of the country, uh, takes a little bit of getting used to to understand how to hunt whitetail here. And what is really popular in our portion of the country uh, is basically not not uh, intruding into the timber, uh, but more or less of food plotting the open areas of your farm per se and bringing them out of that timber to where they got to come out to where they're visible. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, the wind here is, is crazy. Uh, it's, um, I, I know you guys probably hunt by wind out there, but wind here is, is wicked um, yeah. for the sheer fact that the, the area here in Tennessee is kind of rolling. Mm-hmm. So if the wind on your wonderful piece of technology your phone <laughs> says you have a southwest wind at five miles an hour you take it for what it's worth but you don't really believe that till you get to your hunting location and hit your windicator and see what it's doing there because the wind moves all over the place so basically the way we hunt whitetail here in the south is we typically don't go deep into the timber uh, because wind changes terrible in there so mm-hmm. we typically try to hunt the outskirts on food plots where the does come out to feed, where the does is at, where the bucks are going to be. Yeah. Um, but going through the Midwest, it does change um, because they got big open ag fields. But up there, it's a whole lot easier to find those pinch points um, to where you can narrow down. And, and bow hunting is much more productive there than it would be here in the big timber of the southeast. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're <clears throat> you're excuse me, you're going to be hunting like from a stand most of the time, or is it is spot and stock hunting very popular down there? Or? Uh, I know that I knew this was going to come up in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> All my buddies out west, they're like, "You sit in a tree stand for how long and don't move?" I'm like, "Yeah, you know, in a rut, 12, 14 hours a day." They're like, "You're crazy. Why don't you get out and walk?" Uh, here, it's just not possible, man. In your country, absolutely, it mm. would kill me to sit in a tree stand uh, out there. I just come in from Wyoming, was out there hunting mule deer. Uh, your spot and stalk style of hunting out there for Western big game, and I'm sure whitetail as well, is wonderful. And by far, is probably the, my most passionate thing to do. But here in the South, you just can't do it because yeah. the timber, again, is so thick. And I know we're redundant talking about that, but it is so thick that you could be bumping deer two or 300 yards away that you never see that just silently turn mm. and walk off. It, it's just not possible down here to do that yeah. and and not to mention there's a whole lot more hunters uh hunting down here uh than it is out in your portion of the country too so here if a man owns 10 acres i mean he can deer hunt that 10 acres because there's probably 10 or 15 deer living on that 10 acres to be mm. truthfully wow. um so so yeah it's hard to spot stall down here number one uh, because the timber is so thick and then number two is you, you just don't have the big open bass country to be able to cover four, five, six, eight, ten thousand 10,000 acres like you guys have out there. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, I just think about my my wife's, has, her grandpa has a ranch. It's like 600 acres. And we hunted hard, and we saw, you know, just a handful of deer in 600 acres. And to think that there's, they're the, they're, the population is that dense, you know. But, I mean, think about, too, like you said, there's a lot of other hunters down there. 
and um, a lot more people hunting for the same areas. Uh, it actually kind of rises a question. What's the public land hunting like versus private? You know, because you mentioned a lot of farmland and stuff like that. Is public land hunting very popular down there? Uh, so it is very minuscule, the amount of acres that we have here that's huntable publicly. Mm. Um, I would say 5% oh, wow. of the ground is public here. It's very small. And there are, there are a few big blocks here or there, but I'm telling you, it is a minute number. And that's one reason that I had ventured to Illinois in my first out-of-state um well, first non-resident hunting trip. I didn't know farmers or landowners up in Illinois, uh, but on the southern portion of Illinois, there's a place called Shawnee National Forest. Mm -hmm. There's about 180,000 acres of public ground there, uh, and the whitetail hunting is exceptional. Um, so that's the reason I had worked my way that way quickly uh, and, and probably the easiest place I could gain access. But through the Midwest, well, through the Southeast and through the Midwest, there's there is pockets of public ground, but it's it's not a lot, man. And that's what's tough. Interesting. And I'm sure that that stuff gets filled up fast, too. If you did want to hunt it, there's probably a thousand hunters there, you know. You betcha. Yep. Yeah, you know, the old terminology, the pumpkin patch, patch during gun season, I'm sure is a pretty pretty uh, relevant scenario in a lot of the public ground around this country here because it, it's, it's just not big enough for a lot of folks. And, and unfortunately, our... Well, obviously the country's growing like crazy, uh, but here in our area in Tennessee in particular is kind of a boom town and there's folks moving here all the time mm -hmm. uh, that, that don't own ground that maybe will never be able to afford ground. And if they want to hunt, um, they'll have to go to public ground and it's, it's going to be a fight for them. Yeah. Boy. Yeah. That's pretty rough. Um, and kind of, I guess kind of shifting gears here a little bit. I do want to talk about disease um, because I know that, disease has been affecting deer populations for forever and we're yeah, starting man. to see a lot of that in our area um i'm getting a little bit nervous because a lot of the farmers and people that i'm talking to around here they're saying they have dead whitetail just all over their property uh just from uh i don't know it it's not really blue tongue up here i suppose but it's it's a very similar disease and there's all the you know the other you know chronic the wasting EAT. disease or whatever in most cases, it'll be EHD, which is epizootic hemorrhagic disease. Uh huh. Yeah. And so, how have you seen down south? How have you seen populations affected by that? Is it target specific age groups of deer, or how does that look? You know, the the EHD is is non selective. It'll kill them big or small, short or tall. It does not matter. Uh, the the young and strong, and the the older and weak, uh, before rut, after rut. Um, it, it, it's not specific to that. Um, uh, for years um, of hunting the Midwest, I've become very fond of and, and become a land investor in, in Southern Illinois and then moved to West Central Illinois, the quote unquote, the golden triangle uh, of that state, which has always been known for producing really big whitetails and in a couple of different counties there on that Iowa line. Uh, I ended up moving up there um, uh, and buying ground there and becoming an outfitter there for for several years had a big hunting lodge and we covered lots of lots of acres thousands and thousands of acres of whitetail habitat and some of the best whitetail habitat in the country mm -hmm. um and it basically depended on the year uh what that disease would be like and it seemed to be the drier years were more this is a bad way to say it but more effective on killing whitetail mm. um uh, it, and basically those drier years allowed up there, there's a lot of ponds, uh, and, and on a drier year, those, that water would recede backwards and down in the ponds, if you will, leaving a muddy ring. Uh, and that muddy ring around that pond edge was, would be where a bug called a midge, uh, would come from, mm -hmm. uh, to my understanding. Uh, obviously I'm not Dr. Grant Woods, uh, <laughs> but talking to Dr. Grant Woods, again, another great friend of mine. Um, it's, it's how I've learned some of this stuff over the years because we, I myself, my friends, the guys, guides that worked for me, worked with me up there in my place in Illinois, uh, if it was a dry year, uh, it would always raise our temperature a little bit mm -hmm. uh, because we knew at some point we were going to start finding dead deer at the end of the year. Uh, I say end of the year, start of hunting season, end of summer, I should say, not end of year, but mm -hmm. physically end of the year, but end of the summer uh year uh going into hunting season 
Um, if it was a dry one, we were sure to find dead deer, and it'd be fawns or 180 inch whitetail. It, it it did not matter. Um, here in the south, it doesn't seem to be as harsh uh, because it rains here a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I can't say that I have personally ever seen an EHD or a dead deer here because of something like that. Um, probably 12, 15 years ago, we had a touch of blue tongue, uh, but that blue tongue stuff has seemed to disappear. It's almost, well, it's almost like the Corona is, a, the, the Rona is today that we're living in in this world right now. Um, you know, people don't talk about the flu. They talk about COVID. Um, people don't talk about EHD anymore in the white tail world. They talk about, uh, um, I'm sorry, they don't talk about blue tongue. They talk about EHD, the epizootic hemorrhagic disease. Um, and, and it is tough through the Midwest and I hunt Wyoming a whole lot. And, and I got a, a bunch of great rancher friends out there, obviously a dry area, mm-hmm. uh, talk about finding white tail there all the time. And, and even, and I don't know if this is correct or not, but they chatter at the coffee shop about that also spreading into the, the mule deer population as well um, mm. and how weak the mule deer population is in some of those portions out there now. Interesting. And so you say up in Illinois, the water would recede, there'd be mud. Does the, yep. is it like a little parasite, does it get in through their hooves? Is that how it gets in? No, it, no, it actually it actually gets goes up into their nostrils. Um, and then, and the lack of bird, lack of better words makes them go crazy. Hmm. Uh, and, and eventually we'll set up a fever in their body. And most times when we find, when we would find them, they would be in a water hole or in a creek somewhere. They would go back to that same water hole, to try to try, I guess, try to knock the fever down by getting in the water. Uh, so typically they were always found around a water source of some sort. Interesting. And uh, is say you shoot one that hasn't died of it yet. Is there risk to you, or is there any way to identify that you shot one like that, or how does that look for the hunter? Yeah, you know, uh, we talked to the local DNR there for years when this was really when it first started coming on. Obviously, it was shocking everybody to death about what was going on and what was happening. Um, and we come to find out if they they can survive, um, and if they do survive. Um, I'm sure in, in you guys' this country, people talk about um, a horse that has been foundered. Um, and basically, a foundered horse's hooves will turn and grow up on the points, mm. almost like, I, I hate to say elf shoes, but would have a curled up end on their hoof. Yeah. Uh, a white tail that survives EHT, EHD will do the same exact thing. They will have a really elongated hoof. And most time the, the hook would curl up on the ends and point up back up at the sky, almost like mm. a banana shape. Um, and supposedly, uh, it's not transferable to, to humans. So consumption is good or is okay. Um, not say everybody's okay with doing that, but I, yeah. I have been told by several DNR agents in many states, uh, that it was not transferable to humans. Interesting. You know, they say that until 20 years from now. They find out that it is, and then. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll let you know. Yeah, <laughs> I have I have consumed a portion of one that that was confirmed EHD after, um, yeah. after we had had it processed and things like that. So, but that was five years ago, and I still I still relatively okay right now. Your fingers aren't curling up at all, or no, <laughs> no, no. My toes look the same. I'm not taking my shoes off. I know you want to know. But I'm not taking my shoes off. Awesome. <laughs> Um, and I guess kind of going into muzzle loading a little bit deeper, uh, what's so like a lot of times when we talk about hunting, uh, our listeners want to know what we recommend, or in this case, what you recommend as far as bullets, as far as guns, um, low, like powder charges, like what is your go-to and recommendation for white tails when it comes to the logistics of the hunting? You know, the, um, I, I, I say the hottest topic or the longest topic that I have been dealing with uh, being in the muzzleloader industry for 25 years is bullet weight. Mm-hmm. 250 or 300. Yeah. That's the most <laughs> common fight. Um, uh, and uh, at first, when I first got in the industry, it makes sense. A lot of bullet, faster, flatter, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, a muzzleloader hunter is not a whole lot different than an archer. He has effectively one shot 
yeah. to make his trip a success or a failure. Um, so if you think about it mechanically, the I, I have a couple samples of bullets here. So I have two bullets right here. These are power belt ELRs. These are new bullets. I'm not mm-hmm. sure if you can see them there or not. This one here with the black is a 50 caliber, 325 grain bullet. This one here is a 45 caliber, 285 grain bullet. Both of these bullets hover around that 300 grain mark. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, younger, I was thinking that that lighter bullet was faster by far. That's what you want. But at the end of the day, when an archer, when he goes to Africa to hunt, we'll say he's hunting, uh, the, the big five. Yeah. He does not go with a white tail hunting setup. He goes with a really heavy bow as far as pull weight, a really heavy arrow for one reason. That's kinetic energy. Mm-hmm. How hard you're going to hit that sucker with the one shot that you have. Um, so taking that same theory into hunting with a muzzleloader, I'm always going to lean towards the heavier bullet because it has more kinetic energy. Mm -hmm. We'll think of it mechanically. So um, if you're going down a road at 65 miles an hour and you're driving a Volkswagen or you're driving a dump truck with 22 ton of gravel on the back of your truck Mm -hmm. at 65 miles an hour, which one's going to do more damage to whatever it hits in the road? Yeah, the dump truck. Of (laughs) course, the dump truck. They're both running the same speed, but one's got a lot more kinetic energy because it weighs more. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, in the big arguments over the years, always lean towards that 300 grain bullet for the sheer fact that it has more kinetic energy when it hits the animal. And again, you have really effectively one shot to make your trip a success or failure. Um, Also to keep in mind too, that we'll say hypothetically you're shooting a 50 caliber, which is kind of what most of the world shoots today. Um, you're shooting a 50 caliber, you're shooting a 250 grain bullet. Then you jump up to a 300 grain bullet. Well, that 300 grain bullet doesn't get fatter. Mm -hmm. It gets longer. Yeah. If it got fatter, it would not go down the barrel. So it gets longer. So we'll take this back again, mechanically, an archer years ago used to shoot what they called an overdraw. So they'd shoot a really short arrow. So it was really fast. Mm Mm-hmm. But today, nobody does that because that short arrow was not accurate or, for, or uh, efficient and forgiving. Yeah. When you shoot a heavier muzzleloader bullet, it gets longer. So the longer the bullet, the better it stabilizes in flight. So you're going to get more kinetic energy, and you're going to get uh, a more accurate three-shot group with a heavier bullet than you will a lighter bullet. So with that higher BC... Uh, which is what you're talking about, right? With the better stabilization and stuff. Does that affect yes, how much powder you need to use behind that charge? Do you need to use a Magnum charge in that instance? Uh, so, and I, so I, I think maybe you're kind of gathering that my mind is very mechanical. I like mm-hmm. custom hot rods. I like building stuff. I am just a mechanical guy. Um, so what kind of car do you drive? I drive a 2002 Ford Ranger. And what does the speedometer say on it? Uh, it goes up to like what, like eighty or something like that. I've never driven it that fast. I don't think it'll go that fast. <laughs> okay, so we'll say it says. I must. I'm gonna say it probably says about one ten. Yeah, it always like gives you more than what you can drive. But we'll say it says eighty. Yeah. So, so at a maximum capacity, your Ford Ranger will run eighty miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Does it handle better at eighty? Or does it handle better at about 65? Yeah, 65 for sure. 65 for sure. So that's the same scenario with these muzzle-loading bullets, no matter what bullet it is. Most guns on the market today, well, I'm sure every one of the guns on the market today, uh, are a magnum gun, meaning they will shoot a magnum charge. Typically, that's 150 grains of powder. Mm -hmm. I will say that is in a, um, a volumetric measuring situation. So 150 grains of powder. That is as maximum as you can push that bullet, as hard as you can push it, build as much kinetic energy as you possibly can. But again, we have one one bullet to mm-hmm. make our, tri- our trip a success. So do we want to hit them hard and fast, or do we want to hit them accurately? Yeah. We want to hit them accurately, just like you're 
Ford Ranger running 65, it handles better. So n just because your gun, no matter who the maker is, just because it is a Magnum gun and it'll shoot 150 grains of whatever propellant you, you decide to use, doesn't mean that's where it handles the best. Mm -hmm. um, so to answer that question in a very long-winded explanation is, is you don't have to shoot more powder. You don't have to push the bullet harder. Typically, it's less powder. Um, it Obviously, you will lose a bit of muzzle velocity. You will lose a bit of kinetic energy, but it's much more important if you have a $10,000 elk hunt somewhere or another to be shooting accurately, not fast. For sure. Yeah. And I would venture to say that the barrel length will change your your performance range. Uh, like if you're shooting a, a wolf that has a 24 inch barrel versus an LRX that has a 30, you could probably afford to use a little bit steeper charge in the, in the LRX. Uh, that is correct. Obviously you got longer barrel length. You have uh, more time, if you will, uh, because of barrel length to burn that powder charge. So, mm -hmm. so for sure, um, if you were shooting um, uh, 80 grains of powder in a wolf and 80 grains of powder, uh, in a LRX, uh, our new 2021 model, uh, you would definitely have more effective burn on that longer barrel length. Interesting. And I've always kind of wondered how that works with the Paramount because the Paramount actually has a little bit shorter barrel, um, but you use even more powder in it. Uh, is it, is it the large rifle primer that gives it that extra punch? Is that what it, what it does? Yep. So when we were building the Paramount, it was about a three year R and D situation before we actually released that to the world. Um, and what we realized about halfway through, um, was that one of our key pieces was going away from the 209 shotgun primer and going into the large rifle primer. Uh, and what we realized is, is that the 209 shotgun primer was so hot, which obviously uh, you want a hot ignition. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was so hot that it would it become abusive um, to yeah. where that actually it would dislodge the powder charge and would push it forward in your powder collar or, or basically the base of the barrel. It would push that powder charge and bullet or projectile forward before it actually would even ignite the powder. Wow. Uh, so it, it would give us a standard deviation sometimes up to 80 feet per second. Um, and when we're talking shooting 100 yards with a muzzleloader, you're never really going to see and understand how bad of a deviation that is and because uh, you're not going to see it on paper mm -hmm. when we're talking four five six hundred yards that we're shooting with this paramount now 80 feet per second in a string of three shots is huge yeah devastating um and when we went over to that large rifle primer it's also a very hot ignition source but it's not abusive it's a small primer with a lot of heat so you get ignition instantaneously uh, versus a forward push of the powder charge like the Blackhorn 209. I'm sorry, like the uh, W209 or the Winchester 209 primer would give you. Um, and, and that's why, yes, a little shorter barrel, but much, much more efficient. And it basically backs down to the ignition source. Interesting. Man, that's, you're answering all my questions. Because I always wonder, it's like, man, how do they get it to do that? Like, does it really boil down to the large rifle primer? And, and if so, how? Like, all that kind of stuff. So, um, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was it was, it was hard to, to think about that because we've been shooting um, uh, 209 shotgun primers forever and thought yeah. it was the best thing since pocket on a shirt. Yeah. Um, and then when we come out with the Paramount or working on the Paramount behind the scenes, if you will, in R&D development side, um, we realized if it was going to work, it had to be a large rifle primer. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the performance on the new Paramounts is just absolutely insane, you know. So really excited. We, we actually just got uh, we got a, a marketing HTR that we're going to be trying out and rigged it all up. Oh yeah, I know you got some in. Yeah. I may have heard somebody <laughs> say that you guys got some. <laughs> yeah, it's we're pretty excited. We uh, plan to do some cool stuff with that. So um, kind of along these lines, backtracking just a touch. Uh, do you have any muzzleloader hunts coming up this year, or have you been muzzleloader hunting this year? Uh, well, I'll say this in a. Uh, southern format uh does 40 pounds of dough make a big biscuit <laughs> you'll have to explain that one to me I, i'm not from the south <laughs> <laughs> one big clump of, of, of dough makes a huge biscuit when it's 40 pounds worth so there you go 40 pound biscuit absolutely i have muzzleloader hunts coming up yeah. um you know um 
uh, just because of doing what I did back in my early 20s, uh, spending time through the Midwest, um, muzzleloaders have, have become, you know, you hear the word passion, I almost say addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's bad. Um, I, I collect <laughs> them, I shoot them. Uh, I, I am a really big fan. Um, and again, I think it's because my mind is, is a mechanical style setup, if you will. I, yeah. I love being able to load different powder charges, different projectile weights, and seeing how all of it mechanically comes together. It's almost like you build a new gun every time you, you change the load. And um, with today's modern propellants, um, like Blackhorn 209, a, a loose powder, uh, and now, uh, because we're even taking it to the next level by weighing our powder which we never thought we'd cross that path but yeah it's become so amazingly cool to tweak our powder charges in grains just like a centerfire reloader would um but yes a lot of really good whitetail hunts coming up this fall and and of course i'll date us here just a little bit but we're here at the end of october which things are starting to crank up uh we had a really big cold front come through today here uh in tennessee today the weather's going to be in the 50s and 40s here for the coming week um, and then with the, we're about seven days out from the kickoff of muzzleloader season here. Uh, I may or may not have a few that's on the hit list per se. Um, <laughs> so I have a Paramount HTR 40 caliber uh, that I'm going to use here in my home state. Uh, I got Indiana, uh, Missouri, Iowa. So I got a few tags still left to burn, and, and we're just now getting into the heart of goodness. Oh, man. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah, I I think out of state hunting is kind of the next step for me. And, um, you know, it, what advice would you give to somebody if they wanted to go on like an out of state whitetail hunt? Uh, like what areas are like the hot spots? Um, and what would it be with a muzzle loader? Like what's your, your tips there? Uh, so there's, there's, that could help be a whole nother podcast in itself, but, <laughs> um, on all of my social media, uh, channels that I play with my, Nickname is Traveling Hunter. The TV show that I hosted on the Outdoor Channel was Traveling Hunter. For the sheer fact of that's all I prefer to do, even though I, I love hunting here at home, but, man, I love to travel mm-hmm. and experience what other states have to offer. Uh, and in most cases, I try to, obviously, do it around a muzzle loading season because typically a muzzle loader hunter is the first guy in the timber with a bang stick. Mm-hmm. Most time, muzzle loader season follows an archery season, so I like to go in with the element of surprise, and that's, you step out to 100 yards, buddy, you're not in a safe zone anymore. Um, <laughs> got a scenario. Uh, but, but I think the part of the, the key feature is is to look for states that have over-the-counter tags. Um, uh, some of the Midwestern states you have to draw for. Um, uh, Iowa is a very sought-after state in the Midwest for producing big whitetail. Obviously, a lot of TV celebrities live in the state of Iowa for the sheer fact of the hunting is amazing there. Mm-hmm. Um Downside is it could take up to three years to draw a tag. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I'm the kind of guy that I stay pretty busy and I really don't know what I'm going to do when we turn this, uh, this podcast off, let alone what am I going to do three years from now? So <laughs> the last, the last thing I want to do is, is plan a three year hunt, a, a trip out three years to go on a hunting trip. Yeah. I want to go right now. I'm that in a instantaneous gratification kind of guy. Let's do it right now. Yeah. Um, obviously it's in season, of course. Um, <laughs> but, but there are several great states that have over-the-counter tags. Uh, one that's really close to you is the state of Nebraska. Mm-hmm. Um, through, uh, I, I guess, my 30s, I would do tours through a lot of big box stores um, in their fall classics and do uh, seminar topics about hunting with a muzzleloader. Uh, and the, the place I ended up uh, at the end of every uh, seminar topic was always hunting Nebraska because um, it's a late season tag. It's over the counter. So if you get the wild hair to want to go hunt late season with a muzzleloader, you can drive to Nebraska. Um, and they have some really great whitetail there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Indiana is over the counter. Again, if you catch a whim, you can go to Indiana. Mm-hmm. Um, Ohio also is over the counter. Great state. Uh, Illinois, you do have to draw uh, per county there. So mm-hmm. it is a bit more difficult. Uh, but I say in, uh, man, well, since 1992, I've never not drawn a tag in Illinois. Mm. So you just kind of got to pick it, uh, of what your time schedule is, but I would definitely do it with a muzzleloader because I am 
obviously very biased and uh, <laughs> I like to be the first guy in with the bang stick. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's something I'm definitely going to have to check out because, uh, you know, I'd love to start traveling a little bit more and just doing some research for some other videos I was making. And there's all kinds of awesome hunts all over the country that I was previously completely unaware of. So uh, I definitely you will do some of that. There's a, there's a lot of great opportunities for a guy that has a muzzleloader in his hand uh, if he just takes time. And, and we have, when I first started doing it, there were no tools like we have today. There were no, um, there, there well, uh, there was, probably was no World Wide Web, or at least it wasn't in my world, um, <laughs> uh, to, to check these states out online. I mean, you can do so much uh, research and studying now and the use of these mapping services like Onyx Maps and those guys mm -hmm. really has made it handy to plan your fall out around seasons that are and states that are over the counter uh, and have amazing muzzleloader seasons. One of, one of my most favorite in the world uh, is the state of Kansas. Yeah. Uh, Kansas is a draw, uh, but it's not that difficult of a draw state. Um, and Kansas, you can hunt uh, early season whitetail like the 10th or 12th or 15th of September. Whoa. That's when all the bucks are coming to the bean field every evening. There's five or six of them together. Mm -hmm. It's just like going to the grocery store and picking out a steak. You don't walk <laughs> up there and pick up one steak or one randomly run by you in the grocery store like the rut would be. You can walk up and look at the counter and go, oh, yeah, there's five steaks here. I think I'll take this one. <laughs> when you're in Kansas, if you're hunting with a muzzleloader, you can do that in a bean field because there's four or five bucks coming to that bean field every night. Man, it's an amazing opportunity in Kansas if you hunt with a muzzleloader. Boy, that sounds awesome. And is is that a place where you have to have private land? You do not. Uh, I got great friends in Wyoming that journey to Nebraska every year. I'm sorry, Kansas every year because there is a lot of public ground. And I'm mm. going to tell you, when these guys drive back to the state of Wyoming, they're hauling a truckload of antlers with them when they go back. Wow. That's cool. That'll probably be that'll probably be the number one on the hit list as far as out of state hunts go. Then, um, yeah, Kansas is awesome, and they they have a late season hunt also. Um, not as good as Nebraska's late season, but it's a good late season. Awesome. Well, I think we're kind of getting ready to wrap things up here, Tony. Do you have any closing thoughts or anything you wanted to say to our listeners before we jump off here? Well, yes, I do. Um, you know. Uh, I think still today, uh, even though everything that we've talked about here is second nature uh, in regards to muzzleloaders, I know that muzzleloading can be a still a bit overwhelming situation for folks. Mm -hmm. uh, I just dealt with a guy here uh, that I met through social media uh, that was having a tough time with a muzzleloader, and um, it's just that he was in an unknown area for himself. He'd never been taught, had nobody to teach him. He just jumped into it. It was a bit overwhelming for him. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have the desire and want to get into the muzzleloading world and, and hunt with a muzzleloader and take advantage of the great seasons that's offered across this country, I'm sure maybe your home state, if you're listening right now, probably has a muzzleloader season too. Don't miss an opportunity to take part in that season if you're scared to jump into hunting with a muzzleloader. It is absolutely not as tough uh, and, and it's not as foreign as you think it is. Once you step into it, uh, and of course, obviously, tons of videos out there in the world today to watch. I'm sure you guys offer quite a few of them. Mm. Um, uh, don't be scared to hunt with a muzzleloader. Don't miss out on a great opportunity to be in the timber. Yeah, and that's that's what we always say. And that's like our number one thing on the podcast is trying to get helpful information to people who need it, so that they can experience how awesome muzzleloading is um, in all its different aspects. And uh, we're really passionate about hunting, and there is just countless amazing hunting opportunities with a muzzleloader so if you have questions give us a call um you know give cva a call like just call somebody figure it out you know and it's going to be awesome and it's not something that you'll regret i can promise you that is a fact i've based my whole world around it yeah <laughs> awesome well thank you so much for joining us today tony it's been an absolute pleasure brother i appreciate you appreciate your time and appreciate all you guys the diligent effort over there at muzzleloaders.com absolutely thank you for saying that um and thank you guys for listening uh if you want to check out the rest of our videos hit that subscribe button click the bell to receive notifications whenever we post content and we will see you guys on the next podcast